<laughs> hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Dr. Achukan Eshwar. He's broadcasting all the way from India. Please welcome him to the show. It's very nice to meet you. I can't wait to hear about the work you're doing in India. Thank you so much for having me, Chef AJ. It's a real honor meeting you and an honor being on your show. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you find out about a plant-based diet and, and what do you do in the plant-based space in India? Sure. Uh, I've been interested in healing without medicines since the time I was a child. I was 12 years old and I went up to my parents and said, hey, I want to heal without medicines. And they couldn't figure out you know, what to do with me until many years later when I discovered um, natural healing, when I discovered naturopathy and yoga, I became a naturopathy and yoga physician. Uh, and, uh, and then I discovered lifestyle medicine. So let me share the story with you, the personal story of uh, how I was inspired to take up this field. So uh, my grandparents have been diabetic and hypertensive for over 40 years now. They turned diabetic and, and uh, they, you know, my grandfather developed high BP when he was in his 30s. Uh, the doctor put him on medications, but over the decades, the medications got, uh, you know, the you know, symptoms got worse and the medications only increased. When I was doing my internship and I was about to graduate as a doctor, my grandfather called me and said, I have suddenly started vomiting blood. What do I do? So we rushed into the hospital where he was diagnosed with internal bleeding, a side effect of the medications he'd been taking for his hypertension for over three decades at that time. It was a really difficult time for us as he went in and out of the hospital. The doctors did everything they could. They reduced his medications. They put him on alternative medications, but every week he would just land up back in the hospital with the blood vomiting. So at the end of three weeks, he called me and said, I'm fed up. Isn't there a permanent solution to all of this? So we sent him and my grandmother to a hospital called Pavitra Nature and Yoga Hospital in Coimbatore in South India, where they practice plant-based nutrition and they um, you know, teach yoga and they teach a natural lifestyle. In 10 days time, they came back home completely transformed. They had both lost 10 kgs of weight each. Their diabetes had reduced, the blood pressure had reduced, had come back to normal for the first time in over a decade with 90% less medications. My relatives thought it was a miracle, but I was watching hundreds of people undergo the same transformation in the hospitals where I worked. So I decided to dedicate my life to lifestyle medicine, to helping people eat healthier and live a healthier lifestyle. So I graduated at, sorry, you were saying something. Well, no, no, I, I just want to say that's incredible. I've never even heard of a naturopathic yoga physician. I've heard of a naturopath, but not, I've never heard the word yoga in the title. I'd love to know more about that. Ah, lovely. So here in India, the uh, course for becoming a naturopathic physician includes yoga. In fact, the stream is called yoga and naturopathy because it's such powerful um, methods of healing and staying healthy. That is, that is really, I think that's extraordinary. You know, it should also include cooking, you know, a naturopathic yoga chef physician. Absolutely. Uh, interestingly, you know, we have a one year subject of nutrition in the course. Unfortunately, I didn't hear the term plant-based diet more than once in the entire course. It's probably something I'll talk about during the session, the need for it to be changed. You know, you said something about that as the as the symptoms increase, they increase the medication. And that is that is that's Western medicine. You take a medication for something and then it creates another problem. Then you have to take another medication. And that's and that's exactly what you're describing. Exactly. Compounds the problem uh, and it doesn't do anything about the root cause of the disease itself. Uh, so I'm so thankful for people like you who spread the message to address the root cause of the disease help people to stay healthier in the first place. So well, that's what lifestyle medicine is because people are just looking for such a quick fix and a pill for every ill. And the thing is, is it like you say, it doesn't work, not long-term anyway. It, it masks some symptoms, but it really doesn't create health. Exactly. In fact, the quickest fix is to just live healthy because you take medications, it's going to take decades and still not solve the problem. You eat a healthy diet, you could be back to normal in weeks. That's how quickly the body responds. Why? 
people are so resistant? Do you think it's just because it's not the norm or there's food addictions or, or what? I mean, it just, it, to those of us that have embraced this, it just, it's common sense, but other people are like, oh, well, that's so extreme. Absolutely. You know, in fact, even at home, even for myself, when my grandparents came back home, we would cook separately for them, right? We'd like boil vegetables and we'd make uh, boiled rice and lentils with, without salt, without spices, we'd give that to them. And the rest of us ate normal food because we were healthy, why should we change our diets, right? This all changed when I read this amazing mind-blowing study that was published in 1961 here in India. So there was a group of physicians in South India, in a place called Madras, who wanted to find out how many normal people already have heart disease without knowing about it. So at that point of time, people in India thought that we were basically heart attack proof. The heart disease was nowhere to be found. It was very rare in our country. So, uh, so what these physicians did was they took 500 people who had died from unrelated causes, like you know road traffic accidents, people who were healthy, uh, like you and me, who didn't have any symptoms, but unfortunately passed away. Right? They took a piece of their arteries from the heart, put it under a microscope to find out how many of these people already had heart disease without knowing about it. Now, they thought that they'll get a small number, but they were shocked when they found out that 100% of people over age 20 already have the starting stages of heart disease. 95% of kids from age 10 to 20 had the condition. A two and a half year old baby was diagnosed with the starting stages of heart disease. You know, and it's a disease that which predisposition to it starts when before you're born, when you're just a fetus in your mother's womb. By the time you're 10 years old, practically every one of us has it. By the time you're 20, 30, it develops into plaques, it starts killing you off. And today, heart disease is the number one cause of death in our country and across the world. When we read that study, I showed it to my family, and all of us decided to make a complaint lead change. We all shifted our diets and we told my grandparents, so we call them Tata and Pati in my native tongue in Tamil, that's what we call them. So Tata Pati, we're going to join you, we're going to eat the way you eat from today. And, and, and we are going to live as healthy as you do. <laughs> that is so incredibly inspiring. Are, are they still alive, your grandparents? Yes, absolutely. Do they speak English? I would love to have them on the show because they have quite a story because they were the impetus for you guys to make the change. Oh, absolutely. I'm sure they'd love to be here as well. I would love to hear from them. You know, like what you talked about, I've heard Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. talk about how when very young children die, say in car accidents and they do autopsies, they already have the plaque like you're talking about, young, very young children. Absolutely. Uh, you know, in India especially, there have been studies conducted on school children, you know, kids aged five years, six years, seven years old, who have high cholesterol, who have a high blood sugar, high blood pressure, who are obese. Uh, and parents don't, um, you know, they're not able to comprehend that this could happen to their child. And the prevalence rate is only increasing over the years. And that's why it's there is a crucial need for widespread change for every single person to be able to understand this and to be able to change their diets and eat a healthier diet at home. Is obesity as prevalent in India as it is in the United States and is it as stigmatized? Exactly. Obesity is prevalent. Diabetes is prevalent. Hypertension. Um, hypertension is our number one risk factor for death. Right? We have uh, heart disease. Cancer is growing. And all of these are diseases that can be prevented to a large extent, treated, and potentially even reversed with a healthy enough diet and lifestyle. You said you, that your grandparents went to something called a yoga hospital. Tell me about that, because that, I, I, that, I mean, I don't want to go to a hospital ever, but if I did, I want to go to that hospital. Oh, yes. There are hundreds of yoga and naturopathy hospitals all over the country, and all of them practice lifestyle medicine. So the term lifestyle medicine has come about newly, it's been you know, around for a few decades now, but yoga is a system that's been there for thousands of years. Uh, so it has slowly developed just like the lifestyle medicine revolution in the US, the yoga and naturopathy revolution has developed in India, there are hundreds of hospitals where you go check in uh, and uh, you stay there for about 10 days. 
you wake up early in the morning, you have a yoga session where you, you have exercises, you have breathing practices, relaxation practices, like pranayama, meditation. Uh, and then you have a session where they teach you about nutrition, about healthy living. And then you eat a, a delicious spread for lunch. And you have uh, you relax for some time. You have another round in the evening. And at the end of 10 days, you go back home with complete completely changed blood reports, which completely changed labs. You go back home a new person. But the problem is that people come back the next year with the same diseases. You go to a retreat, you lose 50. And okay, so let me tell you the actual story of a couple who I spoke to at one of these hospitals right, when I was in my internship. So they had been coming to that hospital for the 17th year in a row, and they had their 14-year-old boy with them, their son. So um, I saw the son exercising on the treadmill. So I asked him, uh, you know, just joking, uh, I asked him, you know, I know why your parents are here, but what are you doing here in this hospital? And he said, no, my parents brought me here because I have too much of stress. So I took him to his parents and I asked them, guys, um, I see here in your reports that you're here for the 17th time. And yet you have hypertension, high blood pressure, both of you are obese, you have, you know, one of them had an autoimmune disease, one of them had a heart disease. What's going on? If the hospital isn't helping, why are you here? If the hospital is helping, why are you here with the same problems? And they told me, no, look, doctor, we come here once a year, we lose 15 kgs of weight, and then we go back home. <laughs> we put on 20 kgs and now we're back. So, so that's when we realized that the uh, hospitals work great if you want to accelerate healing, but we need to stick with it. So when I graduated, I became a doctor. I decided to focus all my energy on that one single point. How do we get people to eat healthier and live healthier at home for the 355 days a year when they're not at the hospital? So, you know, I, when I first started off, my consultations used to last three hours. I'd sit for three hours with each patient and guide them through the entire science and art of healthy eating, healthy cooking, healthy living, which I quickly realized was not sustainable for me or for them. So we started doing workshops. We started doing cooking classes. There were immersion programs. There were, uh, you know, three month programs where they'd come every week for a support group for, you know, talks and sessions. Um, then after, uh, after a point, we put it all online into our website, nutritionscience.in, where we have uh, uh, a course which is free of cost with over 200 different whole food plant-based recipes, over 90% of which are Indian. So anyone from any part of the country can just log in and get a recipe for their favorite dal or sambar or roti or idli dosas, the samosas, your uh, you know, your gravies, anything that you like, you know how to cook it from the comfort of your home. So we did this for years until my patients came back and told me that, you know, doctor, all of this is great. I've understood how to do it and I'm able to do it on most days as well. I'm healthy. But do you know of anyone cooking this way and delivering it to my home? Life would be so much easier. <laughs> and that's when we started Sampurna Ahara, which is India's first whole food plant-based social enterprise. So Sampurna Ahara literally translates to whole foods. Sampurna means whole and Ahara means foods. So in India, when you talk to a group of people and you tell whole food plant-based diet, you get this. <laughs> no one understands because it's a new term. It's a new word. Many of them have never heard it before. But when you translate it to any Indian language, you say Sampurna Ahara, you say Sasyahara or Shakahara, which is the term for a plant-based diet, people instantly understand, yes, I know that most of my food is Sampurna Ahara at home. And they instantly understand. It is the diet that we have grown up on. It's the diet that we've eaten at home for several generations until about two generations back when it all changed. So we, uh, you know, at uh, the Sampurnahara kitchen here in Bangalore, we cook and we home deliver 
100% whole food plant-based meals. And we are very lucky to have one of the pioneers in the lifestyle medicine field. Dr. Michael Greger is one of our advisors and he has guided us. We, uh, every one of our meals is designed according to his daily dozen foods. So when you eat two Sampurna Hara meals a day, I tell the people who join us, all you need to do is exercise and drink water and you have met 100% of your nutritional requirements for optimal health and longevity. You want to cook at home, we can teach you. If you don't want to cook at home, we'll give you the food. All you need to do is make a choice to eat healthier. That's it. That is absolutely incredible. I bet the food is delicious too. Oh, not to blow my own trumpet, but absolutely yes. In fact, <laughs> I have um, a couple of uh, meals here that I'd love to show you um, of the food that we eat. That'd be great. So, yes. So um, we serve all our meals in these. So these are steel different containers. We have a zero plastic policy. We don't use any plastic for any of our meals or any of our products. Uh, we send out these different boxes to people's homes uh, where they eat the food, wash it, and then the next day we go back to pick it up. Uh, we were uh, contacted by a number of food aggregators who asked us, hey, do you want to list your healthy food on our platform? And we said, sure, will you give us back our different boxes? And they said, mm, that's another thing that we'd like to change, you know. So, so we start off, we have five um, you know, items that we give in each meal. Uh, and for the people watching this show, uh, you know, and I hope this is useful for you to plan your daily meals as well. So this, we start off with a fruit starter. So this is a diced watermelon with some mint leaves, chopped up mint leaves. Uh, we recommend starting every single meal with fruits and raw vegetables. And there is a, a misconception um, you know, across the world that fruits and cooked food shouldn't be eaten together. But this was a theory, the food combination theory that was started in the 1960s, uh, which was eventually disproved. So now we know that uh, when we start our meal with fruits, we get an antioxidant boost. We are able to reduce our calorie density. We're able to consume more fiber. We stay healthier for the next six hours. And interestingly, the traditional Indian meal, which you'd get if you go to any Indian wedding and if they're serving an orthodox meal on a banana leaf, which you may have seen in movies online, then the first item to be served is a peeled banana. Right. So, so the peeled banana, and then you have salads. It's called kosambri, where you have uh, cucumber and tomato and um, a, a moong dal or moong sprouts uh, all mixed together into a salad. That's the second dish to be served. So second following a fruit starter, we have a vegetable salad. And this is a salad with the sweet corn. There's cucumber, there's capsicum, there's beetroot, there's purple cabbage and tomatoes uh, topped with a delicious nut butter dressing, right? And um, after this, so this is one of the dinner meals that we serve, which is, um, uh, which has some a very interesting dish called paniyaram, which I'd like to show you. So this is paniyaram, this is what it looks like. Take one out. So this is what it looks like. It's uh, so this dish is a specialty of a region called Chettinad in southern India, which is popular for its meat based cuisine, meat based dishes, right? So, um, we, they have um, you know, chicken, mutton, they have plenty of meat based dishes. Uh, but when you take those flavors and you use it in a plant based dish, it's absolutely stunning. So, we make this panyaram, which is uh, rice, and this, so this is made from sorghum millet. Uh, and um, um, black gram, we call it uraddal, is ground up into a paste. And it, it's usually fried in plenty of oil, but this one is baked in an oven. So it's zero oil and delicious. It's crisp outside, it's soft inside, it's amazing to eat. And with that, we have two side dishes. We have a chutney or a relish. It's made from coriander leaves. And there is, um, this, so there's a fruit called kokum, which is sour and similar to tamarind or lemon juice. Um, and that's ground up. It's along with the coriander leaves. There's uh, some lentils, there's spices like uh, ginger, pepper, chilies, and turmeric powder in it. 
And finally, you have the side dish that you eat the paniaram with, and that's called a sambar. Uh, so this one has, uh, it's basically like a lentil stew. It has, this one it has cow peas, it has a drumstick, it has brinjal. Um, these dishes were traditionally used when people wanted to prepare meat dishes without meat. So they'd use brinjal, they'd use drumstick, they'd use yam, um, raw jackfruit in traditional Indian cooking. Uh, and that's why the Chetinad Sambar has this particular variety of vegetables used in it. And to end every single one of our meals, we have what we call the flaxseed laddu. So flax seeds are one of the more, the healthiest foods on the planet to eat, the healthiest seed. They're high lignan content, helps you to drop your blood pressure as powerfully as some of the leading antihypertensive medications. They're amazing protectors against cancer. They help to blunt your sugar response. They have a wide variety of amazing uses, but the problem is when you use them in Indian cooking, the result can be disastrous if you don't do it well. So let me share a quick story with you. Um, so I was uh, This was before I got married. Uh, my wife's name is Shyamla. She's my partner at uh, Sampur Nahara. She's one of my partners, our entire family is runs it together. Uh, so before we got married, um, Shyamla and I were scheduled to go out on a date in the evening and I wanted to cook something nice for her. So I made a cabbage curry, chopped up cabbage and cooked it with peanuts and chilies and um, vinegar and some, you know, a lot of exotic spices. Then I saw this flax seed sitting on a kitchen shelf. Now I had never used flax seeds in cooking until that point in time. So I took those flax seeds and decided because it's a special day, I ground it up into a powder, mixed it with a cabbage curry, put it in a box, I was so happy and I took it on our date. When we sat down to eat dinner, I opened the box, it had spoiled or at least we thought it had because it was so gooey, it was stringy. Then you know, after smelling and tasting a piece, we realized it's not spoiled, it's just the flaxseed. That's just the way it is, it's going to make everything gooey. So then we figured out, what do we do? How do we use this flaxseed in our cooking? And after months of experimentation, we, uh, made, we prepared this laddu, which basically has two ingredients, flaxseeds and dates. Mm. That's it. Ground up together, rolled up into a ball, and we enrich this with vitamin B12 cyanocobalamin. So with every meal that we deliver, we deliver one flaxseed laddu. We've had uh, people who have significantly improved uh, all aspects of their health, including their vitamin B12 concentration. And there was one lady who was a, um, you know, a non-vegetarian, a meat eater, uh, at which point she had a good vitamin B12 because the, the meat is fortified with vitamin B12, right? And then she went off meat, she became vegan and the b crashed and she took our meals for a month and they rose back up beyond what she had before. And she was so happy saying, now, you know, no one has any excuses to make me stop eating plant-based That is incredible. I, I mean, I wish this was available by me. And the one dish you showed with the millet and the sorghum that is normally fried, that looked absolutely delicious. Yeah, the paniarams, they're amazing. And, and this is just, I mean, you're blowing my mind. I mean, I wish we had something like that here. We do have food delivery services, but they come in plastic. I mean, the way yours is presented, it's just beautiful. Absolutely. So my wife, Shyamla, is a green warrior. She is one of the people who is very active in the sustainability movement here in Bangalore. Uh, and, uh, you know, and we as a family have been avoiding plastic for many years before we started Sampurna. So when we started, we decided that we need to make a statement, make a change for the better and not use a single disposable or, you know, a single piece of plastic. So every meal goes out in these steel boxes. So, and, uh, you know, every special product that we make goes out in glass boxes. So this is a, you know, a, a box of uh, another type of laddus that we make. This one is a, a dry fruit laddu. So it has figs and um, uh, almonds and raisins and dates and cashew nuts, sesame seeds, has some spices. Um, and we make, uh, uh, you know, and uh, for some um, dishes that we deliver, we deliver it in compostable boxes, which you can actually compost at home. So, you know, happy that not a single piece of plastic is 
gone out from our kitchen. Uh, we estimate that with all of the reusables that we've used until today, we have been able to save more than 400,000 plastic boxes until today. That is incredible. And it's such a it's such a more attractive way to eat anyway, what, how you're presenting it, than to just like, you know, have it in cardboard or plastic. I mean, that's that, because don't Indian people often, I don't know what it's called, but I've seen those things before where they eat from the, the stacked containers. Absolutely. So it's it, call it a tiffin box. Um, tiffin, interestingly, comes from the British word tiffing, English word tiffing, which means snacking. Uh, and, um, you know, so it, that evolved into a meal that you carry with you to eat a light meal. And then it started being called the tiffin box. Um, so when uh, so before COVID-19, before the pandemic, we used to deliver these meals to people's offices uh, and uh, we'd get people calling us and saying, hey, everyone's noticing your box. And these will be two kinds of calls, right? One kind saying, hey, everyone's noticing your box and they're asking me how much food I eat because it's so big and it has five containers. Uh, and can you send me a smaller box? That'd be one kind. The other kind would be, hey, everyone's noticing my box and asking me what I eat. Now I get a chance to show them what I eat and they're so curious about it. Thank you for helping me convert to more people in my office to healthy eaters. That is just so great. Thank you so much. That is just, I just love hearing stories like that of successful entrepreneurs that are doing so much good to help people. How are your customers finding you? Or do they come to you maybe as a physician and then you tell them about this? Or, I mean, how does it work? How, because it's, it's a great idea. I hope that people watching the show, I don't know if they'll be in India, will find you though. Absolutely. So we have people who have come to us for reversing diseases. We have people who come to us for you know, enjoying a pizza on a weekend night. We have people who come to us for catering for a function, for a wedding. So at my wedding, we served hundreds of guests, 100% whole food plant-based meals, and they couldn't believe that it was oil-free, it was dairy-free, it didn't have any animal products, it didn't have sugar, no jaggery, and yet it had a chocolate ice cream. It had a uh, curd rice, which is a kind of staple in an Indian wedding. You, a meal is not complete without curd rice. So we made one using coconut and cashew curds and peanut curds. They couldn't believe it. It was amazing. Uh, and when people came to meet us, uh, like over 80% of the guests, they came said, congratulations, the food is amazing. <laughs> Practically the only thing most people remembered it. We were so happy about it. So people come to get healthy, people come to stay healthy, people come to have a good time. Uh, you know, we're happy to be uh, able to um, fuel the plant-based revolution in India, in hospitals, in cafes, in offices, in homes, and on every plate. And it, it, it just, I, I love the fact that there's so many different courses. It's like each time it's like a different present, like you get another course of delicious food. Absolutely. Uh, when we call people and uh, tell them, you know, we're going to send so and new people sign up, we call them and say that tomorrow we're going to send you your first meal. It's going to have five boxes. So, you know, don't worry, you'll be able to finish all of it. You start with the fruits, you have the salads, and then you go on to the main course, you end with the dessert. By the time we finish telling them all this, like, wow, really? Okay, so many things. Uh, and it makes it a lot easier to eat healthier as well. You know, when you have one dish that you're eating um, for lunch, for dinner, after a few months of eating it, you start craving for something interesting. And this is exactly what we experienced. When we first switched to whole food plant-based diet, we had no clue what we were doing at home, right? And this was before we had even heard the term whole food plant-based. We didn't know that there was a worldwide movement. We just knew that we're eating healthy. So, uh, we would eat boiled vegetables, steamed vegetables, literally boiled rice and lentils, and, and that's about it. Until three months down the line, my family said, look, we see what you're doing, and it's great. We're all feeling better. So we've lost more than 100 kgs of weight as a family. <laughs> We're feeling great, but I really want to eat that pizza. I really want to eat that gravy, which I haven't eaten in three months. And that's when we started experimenting and finding all these amazing dishes, amazing recipes, websites like yours, Chef AJ, where, where there's so many people doing so much of amazing work. Uh, and that led us to creating um, meals at Sampurna Hara. And this weekend, this may be a meal that you might be familiar with. We're actually having a Lebanese feast 
this Sunday at Sampurna, that we're delivering to people all over the city. So like the, um, you know, the South Indian meal that I showed you, in the Lebanese meal, we, you know, start with a fruit starter, of course, in every meal. And we have a Lebanese salad with cabbage and parsley. Uh, and we have falafels that are baked and not fried, four of them. I think the light is kind of blurring it out, but you know, that's a beautiful baked falafel. And we have some baba ganoush and we have a, a Lebanese pulao. Um, I do not remember the name, but I think it starts with an M. It's a rice and lentil pulao. Um, and absolutely delicious food and so happy to be able to entice people to eat healthy. That is so incredible. I want something. Can you come here and start something like this? This is this is just it's it's just mind blowing, and then it's whole food, plant based. It's vegan. It's oil free. It's dairy free. It's refined, sugar free. Where do you stand on the salt? Sure. So we uh, we do two things for salt at Sampurnahara. Uh, one of them is that we don't use salt directly. We use it in the form of miso paste. So the soya phytonutrients have been found to actually protect the body from the negative effects of salt consumption. So you eat a meal with salt, your BP is going to go up, but you eat a meal with miso paste, that doesn't happen. The BP stays the same. So salt is like, it's a shield against soya. Soya is like a shield against salt. So we use miso paste uh, and we also restrict the sodium consumption to 1,500 micrograms of sodium or less per day per person. So in terms of salt, that's about three-fourths of a teaspoon of salt per person per day. So, you know, people who take our meals, we call them before they get the first meal and we tell them, look, your first meal might be a little bland. It might be tasteless compared to what you're eating at home because the average Indian salt consumption, similar to the one in the US, is about 10 to 12 grams of salt a day. Oh, that's a lot. Huge amount, right? And most people don't realize it because in India, there is a, you know, a conception that if I've cooked food at home, it's healthy which is true compared to food from a restaurant, but not true compared to a whole food plant-based meat. So uh, they're used to eating food at home. Uh, and when you step down from that 12 grams down to three and a half grams, it's going to taste bland. It's going to taste like cardboard, but only for the first five days. In five days time, your tongue adapts. You're able to resensitize your taste buds, start tasting the delicious fla natural flavors in food once again. And then even sweet potatoes could be too sweet. Dates, bananas could be too sweet. You may not be able to eat too much of them. And you know, I I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, Shadrach. Neuroadaptation, neuro absolutely. Uh, do, do most of your customers, do they sign up for like long periods of time, like a subscription or can people just get it like once a week, once a month? How does it normally work? So we have a whole wide range from, uh, you know, on one end we have people subscribing to us for over two years now. Everything they eat has been from our kitchen. One of them includes me and my family you know, and plenty of others. Uh, and then we have people who come to us for a weekend um, special meals. Uh, we have people who come to us for special products. So we make deserts, we make um, you know, um, power bars, energy bars, laddus, burfis, halvas. Know, uh, a lot of delicious Indian desserts and exotic desserts like chocolate pops and there's coconut pops and lemon pops and stuff like that. Uh, we make snacks like, um, so, so these are all Indian snacks. I'm not sure um, how many people in your audience would know it, but I hope uh, this gives you an opportunity to check out the delicious snacks online and just Google them. We have a, a snack called a muruk, which is like a, a spiral. Uh, we have a um, karanji, which is like a sweet stuffed pancake that's fried, uh, but we bake it instead. We have um, you know, you know, all kinds of Indian, traditional Indian snacks, which are usually fried in oil or fried in ghee, uh, but we bake it in an oven, we use zero oil, zero ghee, uh, and people just don't believe it when they eat it. Like, are you, we used to get complaints, right? Earlier, we used to uh, package our snacks in paper bags, brown, unbleached paper bags, which you can compost at home and deliver them to people's homes. 
by the time we pack it at our kitchen and we send it to someone's home, it's been about an hour, two hours, right? Uh, some of the natural oil from the peanut butter, from the almond butter that we use in the snack has been absorbed by the paper bag. So people would call us and complain saying, you tell me that you've not used oil, but I can see oil on this bag. And it would take us some time to tell them, no, that is from the peanut butter that's actually healthy for you. Like, it's amazing, it's delicious. We make breads, like sourdough breads, alapino, olive breads. We make uh, muesli loaves, we make pizza bases, we make pizzas, burgers, all kinds of stuff. So that's on one side for a convenient way to eat healthy. And on the other, we have um, thousands of people who want to cook healthy food for their families at home, for whom we've created online courses on our website, nutritionscience.in, where every day we have videos, we have recipes, we have um, material about scientific research that we put up. We have disease reversal programs. We have a course called the Plant-Based Diet Masterclass, where we handhold people to completely shift to a plant-based diet within a month's time. It usually takes a lot less than that for them to have made the complete transition, but a month's time um, for themselves and their families. So our, our dream is, you know, is to enable whole food plant-based nutrition to be accessible, affordable, and in every household in India. That is incredible. The, the classes that you have online, are they in English and can anyone access them from anywhere? Absolutely, they're in English and anyone can access them from anywhere. Um, uh, you know, if you're able to understand what I'm speaking now on this video, you'll be able to understand the sessions. Great, uh, no, what, wonderful, that, that is just really cool. You know, you mentioned that the hospital that people go to once a year for 10 days and then they lose weight, then they come back next year because they gained it back. It almost sounds like you should be in partnership with them where they say, hey, when you leave here, this is the next step. You need to sign up for this, this food delivery service. Absolutely. In fact, we work closely with a number of doctors who recommend their patients to us, a number of doctors who subscribe to our meals to be delivered in their hospitals and then show it to their patients. Hey, look, this is what I'm eating. This is what you can eat as well. Uh, it makes so much sense when we have a patient who wants to you know, go for a retreat, accelerate their treatment. We send them over to one of the hospitals and then they come back to us after that. This is cool. I mean, I had no idea this existed and I'm sure other people didn't. What is the radius to which you can deliver? Uh, so we currently deliver our meals within one city. It's called Bangalore. It's the capital of a Southern Indian state called Karnataka. Uh, and we deliver our deserts and our snacks all over the country, all over India. We have not started delivering outside India simply because of the huge carbon emissions of the transport which we want to avoid. And that's pretty much the only reason. So we have, uh, Sampur Nahara is a social enterprise uh, which is incubated by the Fractal Entrepreneurship Foundation. So it's designed, uh, the foundation is run by my parents and, and they've been my mentors since before day one. They've been my inspiration to start Sampur Nahara in the first place. And, they, uh, and their dream is something called a fractal enterprise model, which is different from a regular company, right? in the sense that it's a decentralized model. And it, to put it very simply, it works the way nature works. You have a forest, which is filled with trees. Every tree is connected with the other trees through a fungal network. Uh, every tree has a trunk, branches, and leaves. Every leaf has veins and cells. That single cell is the, you know, the functional unit of the forest. So we have created that single functional unit of a whole food plant-based support system. And we want this to spread all over the country, all over the world. And very soon, once we uh, you know, finish making our blueprint for our pilot project in Bangalore, we're going to be opening up social franchise options for people anywhere in the world to come and take up a center and run it successfully uh, you know, establish a support system for plant-based nutrition all over. Oh my God, I was gonna say first every city in India and then the, then, the, then the world, that would be amazing. Thank you, wow, what a great, I just love it, this, this, this whole thing that you're doing, so thank you. You know, you uh, mentioned about dairy, that your meals are dairy-free. And there are a lot of people, because not everybody's familiar with your country, but a lot of people just assume that all people in India are vegetarian, which I found out isn't true. There are some segments that are and some aren't. 
But if cows are revered, which is the reason I'm thinking they don't eat them, dairy is actually a very cruel system. Do, do they not understand that, that that's actually kind of almost worse and that dairy cows eventually have to become meat because you can't just give milk forever. Absolutely. You know, the dairy industry is the meat industry, right? So um, a majority of Indians, interestingly, are non-vegetarians, are meat eaters. Uh, but a majority of Indians, whether they're vegetarian or non-vegetarian, consume plenty of dairy. I think we're the largest dairy producer in the world um, and uh, you know, the largest exporter of beef in the world as well. So uh, the I think a, a couple of weeks back, you had the amazing Nibi Jaswal on your show, where she took you through a complete detailed breakdown of India's dilemma with dairy and diabetes and why we, you know, why we are the... Uh, how we've reached here today. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, let me share a small story, right, from the Indian mythology that I understood and then changed my views personally. So growing up, we've had plenty of milk at home, a glass of milk in the morning, glass of milk in the evening. Um, no meal would be complete without curd rice. That's a you know, yogurt mixed with rice. And um, my favorite go-to snack when I came back home after school would be a cup of yogurt with six spoons of sugar in it, especially sweet when mom wasn't watching, right? So, so, so I was, uh, I used to love dairy. But when, um, you know, when I was starting to become a doctor, I learned about the detrimental effects of dairy, how it causes disease. I watched the documentary Earthlings and that completely changed my perspective. I gave up dairy from that point. Now, there is, uh, you know, in Indian mythology, there are amazing, wonderful references to why we should not be consuming dairy, which a lot of people today misunderstand and you know, take the opposite meaning. For example, there is um, Krishna, who um, unfortunately is the poster child for the dairy industry today. Uh, one of the stories around Krishna and dairy consumption goes like this. Right? One morning, Krishna, his brother Balarama, and uh, some of his friends got together and they were going on a walk, going to the towards the forest to have a good time. And Krishna noticed that some of his friends, so these are all children, right? all children, but some of his friends seemed very tired and cranky. So he asked them, what's up? What happened to you guys? Are you okay? So they said, no, Krishna, we are not. We are very hungry. So he asked them, did you eat food at home? And they said, no, we did not have any food to eat at home. We haven't even eaten yesterday. So the background is that Krishna comes from a cowherd community, right? a, a pastoral community, uh, which grow cows and depend on them. And this is during the transition from um, a hunter-gatherer lifestyle to a pastoral lifestyle to an agricultural lifestyle. The Krishna section of our mythology refers to the middle portion, the pastoral lifestyle and how it ended during his time. So uh, he told them, oh, you don't have any food to eat. You must be hungry. Let's go find something to eat. So they go to a nearby house and they go into the house and they find that there is a, there's no one at home and there's a pot of butter hanging from the ceiling beyond the boy's reach. They try jumping, they can't reach it. So what they do is they form a human pyramid. They climb one on top of the other and Krishna climbs on top of all the boys. He takes the pot. You may have seen this in, in paintings of movies. He takes the pot, he breaks it takes out the butter, and then the story gets really interesting. He takes the butter and he gives it to his friends who haven't had anything to eat at home, right? After they've eaten, he takes the rest of the butter and they go on their way, the group of boys. They find a gang of monkeys on the side of the road who also seem very hungry because it's a time when there's not enough fruit growing on the trees. So they feed the monkeys with the rest of the butter. And then they proceed, and then they find the cow herds coming back. Right? So they panic because they've broken apart, they've stolen butter, they've broken into someone's home. So all the boys run away. Krishna smears the butter on his face and pretends like he was the one who ate it all up. So the cow herds drag him to his mother and uh, they tell his mother, look at this boy, 
every day we try to take milk from the cows we have tied up the calves so that the calves don't drink up all the milk right so we can take milk and sell it in the city but this boy he comes and frees all the calves and they finish drinking all the milk there's no milk left for us then when we eventually get some milk we make it into butter we tie it up this boy comes again he breaks our pots he steals all the butter how are we going to survive this was their complaint and his mother yashoda asked krishna did you eat the butter krishna says no i didn't because he actually didn't right? a lot of people think that this is the story of krishna eating butter but the traditional name for krishna mark and chore is literally the stealer of butter he stole butter from people who hoarded it without giving to the um, community who did not have food to eat right and, and fed the people who didn't have food to eat he made sure that the cows were well fed he made sure that people were not exploiting animals for profit those were the morals of the stories in the mythology so you know um, a long story and you know i hope well, it's very very interesting i wasn't even i've, I've heard of who krishna is but i wasn't aware of that story and it's fascinating and, and and i started thinking about it how how do people like not understand that these are sentient beings and that cow's milk isn't for us it's it's for their babies and how i don't know how people bypass that in their brains when they're consuming dairy i know uh, it's like once it becomes a habit it's so difficult to think outside the habit i drink milk i drink milk i drink milk and that's it you can't think about not drinking milk i had patients come to me and say look i'll do anything you want me to do just don't ask me to stop eating curd rice or you know except the coffee i'll do anything right uh, but a few weeks later a few days later in some cases when they get off dairy and they feel amazing they feel like they have gone back 10 years 20 years and they feel like you know they feel young again they are off dairy for good for the rest of their lives they have experienced what an amazing health it feels like they don't ever want to feel sick again i think that's what makes the difference no matter how well you're conditioned by your upbringing by um, whatever reasons in your life that you've gotten conditioned to eating unhealthy foods when you make the shift and you feel great you're going to stick with it for the rest of your life. Yeah. That darn dairy has the all, it's so addictive though isn't it for people? Physiologically. Absolutely. In fact it's designed by nature to be addictive. You know uh, they have the uh, casein on milk breaks down to casomorphins when you consume it. It stimulates the opioid receptors in the brain. It hooks you on because a child an infant needs to be addicted to its mother's milk in order to survive it's a beautiful natural mechanism but when an adult human being drinks cow's milk it causes the opposite effect it causes damage to long term health yeah i think people the take home message the only milk you should be drinking is from your actual biological mother and then even then only for a you know for a brief period of time not the rest of your life <laughs> Absolutely, Shepard. Thank you for sharing that. So, what is a hisma, and how do you incorporate that into your life and in your practice? I'm so sorry, I couldn't hear what you oh, said. What sorry. is? Well, yeah, I have the fan on because where I live, it's about 117 degrees today. That's why I'm oh, dressed God. like this. Yeah. So, what is a hisma, and how do you incorporate that into your daily life and into your practice? Sure. So, ahimsa may be one of the most beautiful words in any language in, in all of history right ahimsa means non violence so when you look at yoga the um, um some few may have heard of ashtanga yoga which is like the eight step process to um, achieving yoga the first step is called yamas or uh, you know the uh, rules that you follow rules of conduct the first yama is called ahimsa on non violence the journey towards becoming a better you starts with non violence so this is a movement that started during the vedic times like 2000 2500 years back when these texts were written which had ahimsa as a central theme right so this was a time when we were transitioning as a society from uh, being hunter gatherers to pastoralists to growing our own food uh, and at that point values like ahimsa became an important part of our society the problem was if you don't have food to eat at home 
and this was very common at that time you will you know uh, not just at that time but even now right, you go to any indian home or a home of anyone who's been born in india or brought up by an indian family you try wasting food on your plate you're going to get scolded you're going to get rebuked like eat up that food don't waste the food right? because we've grown up with a culture that knows what it's like to not have food on the plate right so you don't have food on the plate for a day two days three days five days you're going to feel like eating the first thing you see how do you practice ahimsa at that point right so i believe that it was at this time that the cow was brought in as a compromise as a go between between ahimsa and starvation so you have a cow at home you take care of the cow don't kill the cow don't uh, you know abuse the cow um you take only a small quantity of milk after the calf is uh, drunk all of it all at once treat the cow as a family member keep it at home make the milk into ghee which is shelf stable which is not going to get spoiled keep it on the shelf but don't eat it right away use it for a time when you don't have food to eat at home and even then use it for the people who need it the most young children and lactating mothers and elders and pregnant women right so this is how it came into being Uh, you know unfortunately today for a lot of us we uh, we we drink milk we drink dairy without understanding the kind of violence that goes into the dairy industry so when i when i talk to my patients i talk to my participants at all our workshops i show them some footage from the dairy industry saying this is what this is where your milk came from right here in india we make that connection once that connection is made then you you simply don't feel like it because it's not a natural way of being we are not hunters by nature we don't like inflicting harm on others we don't like harming ourselves and we enjoy being happy we enjoy being peaceful we like others to be happy and peaceful like if you're walking like uh, the sense of empathy is so ingrained into our psyche it's amazing i mean if you're walking on the road right you're holding an apple in your hand or you're holding a pen in your hand you're surrounded by strangers you drop the pen accidentally everyone around you is going to feel like picking it up and giving it back to you they don't know you they don't have any benefit in giving you back your pen but they're going to feel like doing it anyway because it's instinct instinctively we have empathy and you know once you just start thinking about it it's a no brainer to switch from animal foods back to a plant based diet back to our traditional diets in india and wherever you're watching this from all over the world yeah and you know the problem is i think children are given cow's milk and dairy products so young and it, it their their tastes get set so so early for it absolutely and that's one of the reasons for childhood obesity childhood diabetes hypertension uh, and heart disease here in india uh, the good news is when we teach children about where the dairy comes from when we show them how to make their own plant based dairy it takes them all of 15 minutes to make the connection that's it after that there's no turning back they go back home they, so they come to us as families they sit through our seminars our workshops they learn about the ill effects of dairy they learn about the dairy industry they learn about plant based alternatives and you know how to make your own nut milks and seed milks and pulse milks at home they go back home and a week later the parents are calling me and saying yesterday i tried to sneak in a, a carton of milk and my child would not let me do it he said no that's the kind of children respond amazingly well they change so much easier than adults especially when they see that another being is suffering because of them they say no absolutely do you see patients of all ages or only particular ages and do you ever do consults online or is it just an in person type of practice oh all ages and in fact now we do only online consultations as long as the covid pandemic is running so on our website sampurna ahara and uh, nutrition science.in people can anyone can just go ahead book a consultation at a convenient time for them and i'm happy to help them in any way that i can 
That is great. So when you went to become a doctor, you, you, you know, that you have the word yoga in it. So that it, was that part of the curriculum? And is this something you teach to your patients? And is, there a, is it a specific kind of yoga? Because when I think of yoga, I think of there's different kinds. There's Hatha, there's Yin, there's restorative, there's, uh, you know, there's all kinds. So it, it, tell, tell, I'd like to talk a little bit about yoga because I'm a big fan. Ah, lovely, lovely. So um, there are many, many styles and schools of yoga being practiced all over the world. Uh, the form that we practice is a simplified form called simplified Kundalini yoga. So Kundalini refers to the life force or the, uh, you know, the energy that uh, literally keeps you alive. And when we, we uh, practice a form of meditation, which anyone can learn within a few minutes time, uh, and uh, then you'll actually be able to feel your energy, like any energy healing form, like Reiki or Prana healing, or um, even when you're, you, you know, practicing deep relaxation, and you feel that wonderful feeling that you get when you relax. Um, we uh, practice Kundalini Yoga, where you meditate on that feeling uh, until you reach a thoughtless state of mind. So the um, um, so what would you like to know about Chef Eiji? You let me talk, I'm going to talk for the next two hours. Okay, no, 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 we'll definitely want to have you back, but is it, is it something, like when you have a patient, like wh where do you start? Like is the first thing the food? Do you tell them that yoga, meditation? Like how do you work with a patient? And you know what I'm saying? Like if, if they've got, you know, if they're having a heart attack, you don't say, well, let's do some yoga. So how, how do you incorporate all these lifestyle changes with your patients? Sure, sure. So 80% of disease reversal in most cases is diet. 20% is relaxation, physical exercises, and connections to your loved ones, right? So we explain all of this, and we start with a comprehensive program where we incorporate aspects of every one of this with a focus on nutrition and diet. We work closely with their doctors, you know, because sometimes for, correction, sorry, most times, the doctors who uh, my patients are seeing otherwise, the general physicians who they go to or um, cardiologists or endocrinologists, they have not heard about whole food plant-based diet. Last week, last week, I went with uh, uh, one of my relatives to a doctor for their regular consultation. I was you know, ferrying them to and fro. I just wanted to be with them. Uh, and uh, we got a 20-minute lecture from the consulting physician where he was telling me, have you heard of these vegans who eat only grass and they get into all kinds of nutritional deficiencies and they cannot survive for more than six, six months? These were the exact words that he used. And I was shocked. I didn't know what to respond. You know, so, you know, that's the sad state of so many medical physicians because we're not taught these in school. So we... Uh, you know, we work with my patients' doctors as well. We show them about the recent advances in medical science, about how we're helping their patients uh, and how we can work with them to get their patients on a healthier lifestyle. Because the biggest problems doctors face is they know that if a patient eats a healthy diet, they will get healthier, but they don't know how to make them do it. They don't have the time and they don't believe, this is the worst part, they don't believe that people are going to follow it, right? And I mean, that's no excuse. If you think I'm not going to do it, you know, you're not even going to tell me about it. And then it becomes your fault for having made me sick, right? So as a doctor, it's my duty to make sure I do everything in my power to help every single patient adopt a healthier lifestyle and diet. So we work with them, we work with their families, we work with their physicians, we teach them about nutrition, we monitor their blood reports, we monitor their health progress, we bring them onto a path of healthy eating. We, most people who join us stay with us for years. We've had people for the last more than seven years now that we've been working in this field. And we have thousands, tens of thousands of people who have completely radically changed their lives given up medications, um, got their sugar levels, BP, their, blood, you know, their um, body weight back to normal. We've had people who have uh, taken plant-based diets, yoga therapies for as a support during cancer treatment, who've recovered from cancer, uh, and they feel so great, so amazing, that they talk about it to all their friends and family. So 
I hope that answered your question. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for the work you do and the passion that you bring to it. If people want to connect to you, are you active on social media? How, how we will put everything you want, including clickable links in the show notes, but is what is the best way for people to find out more from you? Sure, absolutely. So um, since most of your audience is in the US, uh, I'm pretty sure that if I ask you to Google for Achyutan Ishwar, you're not going to be able to remember it or do it. So I think we will rely on the links that Chef AG posts on this video. Uh, but uh, probably something that may be easier to remember is nutritionscience.in. That's our website. And my email ID, my personal email ID is Dr. D-O-C-T-O-R at nutritionscience.in. Please feel free to write to me anytime you have any concerns about your health, you have any questions about plant-based nutrition, anytime I'll be happy to help. Thank you so much. And I'm going to be thinking about your food all day. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so much for having me here, Chef AJ. It's been a real honor to be speaking with you and to be on your show. Thank you so much for the amazing work that you do. And congratulations on crossing the 600 videos on the Chef AJ show. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. I feel the same way about all the wonderful doctors that I've interviewed from India this week. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for another fabulous guest.